This will probably be the first video in a while where a PC component or electronic made me completely scrap my original script due to the difficulties of running in a straight line and keeping it that way throughout all of the data collecting and benchmarks. The GPU I'm about to show you is super cheap, easy to get your hands on, and doesn't require a lot of power to run. It allows you to play DirectX 12 titles and even has 4GB of VRAM, making it slightly better than some of the GPUs that I have reviewed previously. It sounds like a deal that is too good to be true, and because it sounds like that, maybe, just maybe, it isn't the best deal after all. The AMD Fire Pro W5100 is a mid to high range card that was released in 2014, nearly a decade ago. I ran into this guy trying to find a cheap GPU that could run newer titles similar to an RX 460 or a GT 1030, but with 4GB of VRAM that could be relatively easy to get and not cost an arm and a leg in the process. There are many different cards out there with their own advantages and disadvantages, and I looked at many different ones, popular and rare, which led me to run into him. But while there is many good things I'd like to say about this card, like it having a power draw of only 50 watts, only taking up a single slot up on the motherboard, and not needing an extra 6 or 8 pin power connector to run it, since it runs all of its power from the PCIe port, there's many more issues ahead that you would not think about when you just buy this guy online. With the GT 1030 or RX 460, you can still expect driver support currently, and ease of installation since they are popular cards, unlike this fella. But I will get to that in a moment. First, let's talk about the price you can pay to get this card, and what it is packing for its hardware specs. I was able to nab this guy for the low, low price of 25 bucks. Yep, that's right. And what's even funnier is that I've seen it run for technically $20 before, making it very affordable for a budget GPU that could be easily thrown into almost any rig without having to make sure you are absolutely curling your cables or other accessories and whatnot due to its size and the form factor it has. It might even be small enough to fit into some ITX builds, making it viable enough to use until one day you get the proper cash to upgrade towards something more new and powerful. Typically, I've seen them go for $30 on average, but if you are real patient, you can technically get it for the price I paid if you just take your time and wait for someone to sell it cheaply. Or the price I also saw it go for, which I wish I had gotten it at. This is its strongest selling point, I feel, because the specs aren't bad, but they leave you wanting more, especially when we comb through some of the frame data I collected. We already know we have 4GB of GDDR5 VRAM, which is clocked at 1500MHz, but our actual GPU clock speed is rather slow, running at 930MHz with a supposed boost to 1000MHz. While I never really saw the boost activate in my tests, I do suppose you could overclock this card a little to achieve more performance anyways, but I am getting way ahead of myself here. Let's talk about some of the problems slash complications with this card that I had and that you will most certainly run into. For starters, drivers are not just install and you're done. While there isn't any Intel Arc levels of requirements for you to run this GPU at its full power, you can't just install the drivers from AMD's website and just go with this card. You will run into this OpenGL error if you try, as others have in the past. And if you look to see if the driver actually installed with a program like GPU-Z, you will notice that it believes the driver is from 2015. Trying to launch the latest DirectX 12 titles out there will prove to be futile, as the games will either refuse to run or crash. Some have suggested installing some of the older drivers to deal with this, but from what I've seen, the performance is pretty subpar when you do this as a result, at least from what I found. I decided that I'd rather spend nearly eight hours or a whole afternoon downloading whatever drivers I could get from DriverEasy since I want this GP to run at its full potential. So off the bat, unless you're an enthusiast or you are on a budget or both, you'll have to spend a bit of time just to get things rolling if you want to use this card properly. After manually installing those drivers though, I went ahead to launch Modern Warfare 2 again to see if those drivers worked. And they do. Same goes for Hitman 3 as well. Also, with the drivers I received, I appear to have gotten Vulcan support and a slightly newer version of OpenGL, which is kind of cool, I guess. But uh, <clears throat> anyways, let's get focused and finally get to the frame data, or rather the other hurdle that I ran into with this GPU. Unlike the RX 460, I wasn't very satisfied with the result of my first tests. I played every game at 1080p minus Hitman 3 and got around 45 frames per second on average on my first go with almost every title that I tried. Usually with low to medium low settings, turning up textures and stuff like that where the games would let me to fully utilize my VRAM 
and I got a subpar but playable experience overall. I was thinking about calling it there, making the video short and saying this GPU is borderline okay and that you should only buy it for $20 or less or use it for special case uses, like maybe some 3D modeling. Especially since I couldn't record anything with OBS because this GPU doesn't like the program it seems. But then I thought, let's dig a little deeper. Usually I pick a preset or do some basic settings and tell you what I find when I test a game at 1080p. But instead, I will show you the average frame data I collected when I lowered my resolution from 1920 by 1080 to 1600 by 900, and then finally to 1280 by 720. Because if you buy a cheap $20 or $25 GPU like this one, odds are you probably are already used to playing with lower resolutions anyways. So beginning with everyone's favorite Activision game, not actually. I was getting about 44.4 frames per second on average, with a maximum of about 60 and a minimum of about 30. Nothing special. But what if we lowered our resolution, just a touch, to 1600 by 900? The game admittedly does look a tad worse, more than it did already. But objects and models are still distinguishable, meaning I can still aim and shoot and know what I am targeting. Our average then shoots up to 50 frames per second with this change. That's actually a bit better. Our maximum frame rates also jump up to nearly 80 frames per second, with our minimum standing at around 34 and a half. This is much more enjoyable frame rate wise on a higher refresh rate monitor, and I don't lose much quality wise in the process. But could it be better? Lowering my resolution one final time down to 1280 by 720 makes the game a pixel jungle, but not one that you can't see in. I can still aim, shoot, and identify many things, just probably not anything super far in the distance. Our average doesn't jump up very much, especially since our minimum dropped below 30 at one point, probably due to a vehicle exploding or something during my tests with a lot of particles jumping on the screen. But it does increase frame rate overall as our max hits over 90 FPS. So technically, this is better in terms of getting a higher frame rate. However, I think I would stick to 1600 by 900, as that isn't too big of a dip in the already low quality, and I can still enjoy the game with some decent averages. I just wonder how many of the other games will fare, since while this doesn't look super terrible or whatever, some games are not as well designed to accommodate for hardware with settings that already make a game look lesser than great, while scaling resolutions down to half of what they typically will be at a minimum today. Moving on to our next game, Apex Legends, I had high hopes since this game ran with the GT 1030, albeit with everything lowered and with actual resolutions being set to their minimums. And I was able to enjoy that game, sort of. <clears throat> but with the W5100 at 1080p, it looked great. Frame data was similar to Modern Warfare 2 in this resolution. I don't have much to honestly complain about since, unlike Call of Duty, which wouldn't let me max out my textures and VRAM since it said my card was too old. Literally, that's, that's what its excuse was. I was able to experience the game in HD if you want to call it that. It was still very high quality even when I went down to 900p. My average became nearly 62 FPS. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised, but the Titanfall devs really are something else. And when I lowered it one more time to 720p, it was close to 70 frames per second on average. And sure, the quality clearly dropped resolution-wise, but I still found it playable. So cool, I'm happy with that. It could be better, and I bet if I lowered some other settings down to make more things low or whatever, I could achieve 80 or 90 on average but I want my games to look a little pretty at least, so this is good enough for me. Next in line is not Battlefield 2042 because that one was a commercial failure, so we will use a more lovable predecessor as its replacement. Battlefield 5 at 1080p was more or less the same as our last two games. Good, nothing crazy, but playable. And personally speaking, it looks really good despite all this. I am sure if a bomb exploded at your feet, you will really see a frame rate drop, but other than that, it should be pretty smooth. At 1600 by 900, our frame data shoots up with our average gaining 15 frames per second more than it was at 1080p. And don't even get me started on our maximum. What's even crazier to me is that I can't even tell that our resolution dropped all that much. Like when I look closely, I can kind of make it out, but it still looks high definition when you are playing and distracted by all the combat. Even at 720p, our quality is still pretty high overall. I can barely tell. But more importantly, 
our frame rate average reaches 83 and a half, which isn't even as shocking when we see our maximum hits almost 127, and our minimum is nearly 60 at this point. Genuinely, uh, th this is impressive, not just from the game, but that our card is doing this compared to what else we were seeing before. When I was testing initially, I thought maybe it will get close to 100 on a maximum at 720p, but to see that it can go well over and the average can even get close enough makes me actually happy to see that a choice GPU that's something old and unpopular for a card like this can stand up and hold its own despite it all. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, we still have a few more games to go over. I went for an 80 game this time around since they usually pair well with older hardware no problem. Starting at 1080p with Risk of Rain 2, we do pretty good with averages over 60 FPS. While the beginning of the game doesn't have much going on, you can expect frame rates to get slashed in half later on when hordes of enemies overwhelm you. So you might see 30 FPS here or there in a long playthrough. And with that being said, maybe 900p is better for that reason. And yeah, it doesn't look too much worse. And an average of 86 is pretty good to me. I think this is acceptable. But what about 720p? The game will start to look low quality for sure, but we can't get a super high frame rate average, can we? Oh, uh, yeah, we can. 124 frames per second is perfect. More than enough, really. And for 25 or 20 bucks, honestly, I don't know what to say. Sure, our games doesn't look perfect as a result, but for budget builds that are low wage because they are an old office PC and whatnot that you use to run games now and upgrade later, this is awesome. Genuinely, I, I can't find the words to express how surprised I am. I was feeling pretty scuffed and torn on this card because, well, my thoughts were it wasn't going to be able to do much or just be a sorry excuse for you to have a backup GPU. Maybe even use it for learning how to use some random CAD software without building an expensive machine that you may never touch again in the process. But this might be the GPU many people want, if they can get over the large walls that have to be scaled in order for you to use and enjoy them. Now, eSport titles typically always do good, and Rainbow Six Siege was no exception. The game looked great at nearly every resolution, and depending on what you are looking for out of it, you could get what you want. I knew that this was going to be the case for our GPU, at least for this game. But I was more concerned for high demanding titles that have come out in recent years, whether it be a game like Cyberpunk 2077, or in this case, Hitman 3, another DirectX 12 title, which has more than just the GPU acting as a main variable since the game can be pretty CPU heavy in terms of requirements. I only really eyeballed the frame data and noticed that at 1080p, it was less favorable due to its frame rate sticking at around 30-ish, but that I could easily achieve 60 at 720p, and the game would look just fine for what you pay for. I mean, what else can I say? I guess I can point out it is a bit troublesome when you have to go through settings and figure out which ones you need to change or want to get the results you are looking for, and that this card doesn't have driver support anymore. But I feel like that is obvious. Sure, I don't know how well it runs with Baldur's Gate 3 or the few latest titles that are actually good currently, but I could guess that if you are willing to work around its limitations, you could get away with using this GPU as a daily driver. After all, it has four display ports, meaning you could have a quad monitor setup and use it for workstation applications at the fraction of what an actual current mid or high end GPU could offer today. And yes, there will be a moment where you will have to accept the fact that it is old, even though it already is, or doesn't run as well as you would hope it could with certain applications. But considering everything, from its 60 degree max temps at full throttle, to its sleek and small size, I think it's fair to say that if you don't want this card, then you better accept the reality that you will be spending a lot more than what you are seeing here to get what you truly want in the end. Well, enough of my rambling. Let's wrap this all up. What a roller coaster of surprises. I thought this GPU would be a 30 FPS 720p type of card that would only be really good if it was an excuse to choose it over a GT 1030, which I mean it kind of is, but with much more under the hood in terms of what I thought could be possible with such an old and outdated GPU. Sure, it probably has a good few years in it left before it literally can't even start up some new games, but for people who don't care for the latest AAA titles, 
or who just want to play indie games and not much else, or even use it for light 3D modeling, I think it deserves its own honorary badge for good enough. <laughs> well, hopefully you enjoyed this video. It was long and tiring to make, so if you really enjoyed it, like it. If you want to see more or see the quality of my content go up, subscribe. I have a lot in store to share with you guys. And if you have something witty to say or want to call me wrong, go ahead, comment. I dare you. And oh, as always, thanks for watching.